Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that your word be spoken with power and authority, that it would be real to us, Lord, that we would accept it and receive it. Lord, that we would take it with us, that others may truly know that we've been in the presence of the Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Okay, I'm uh, going to continue on the enemies of the cross a little bit. Kind of what we talked about <coughs> darkness and uh, human nature uh, last Sunday. And so, uh, you know, Satan will use human nature to uh, transform us into the enemy of the cross. Okay, whether sometimes, uh, and more than not, people are the enemy of the cross of Christ and they don't even know it. Uh, they are professors and they profess to know Christ or to be walking with Christ, but really they are uh, enemies of the cross of Christ. And I see that often and uh, it's, it's growing more and more. Uh, I believe that, you know, if, uh, if you were to see it, it would be very easy for a religion to be called the enemies of the cross, you know. Uh, and believe me, their, their uh, social halls or churches, if you will, would be very full if uh, the people were to truly go to uh, the church of the enemies of the cross because there's a lot of it. And uh, that's too bad and it's, it's a sad world because of it. See, human nature consists of a lot of things. And uh, so the human nature, number one, consists of power and hierarchy, okay? Uh, that's who we are, okay? We're uh, people, we, we want power. That, that's what we're all about. And uh, highly political and territorial, that's who we are. That's our natural human nature. Power, political, and we want to be territorial. We are uh, kind of gentle to the members of the group, but the outside people we kind of uh, are hostile to, all right? And that's how we are, we're like a pack mentality. That's our human nature. That's what the church has done too. You know, they want they want power. They they become political. They become territorial. They become like a pack, and they're you know nice to those in in around, but uh, those who are outside, they're hostile to. Uh, they don't like. Okay. Uh, you know, on one side we like to fight, and you know battles and wars, and and yet we like to. Know, Negotiate also. You know, that's our human nature. We're, we're back and forth there. Uh, very competitive. You know, and this is all like the Jets. Our human nature. We're very competitive. We want to be competitive. You know, so you start adding all this stuff up. And uh, now we can, we can also, very good one, is we can <coughs> cope with crowding. All right? We can cope being all together as long as there's enough food. Food and water. You start getting a whole bunch of people together and they start starving, you're going to see it getting pretty nasty. Okay? So as long as there's, there's your basic uh, food and water, human beings will get along pretty, pretty okay. Alright? You take that element away, human nature will destroy itself. Okay? It just shows us how, how beastly we really are. If you want to see how, how much of a beast we really are, our human nature, then what you do is get a whole bunch of people together and take their food and water away. Okay? No different than that. Then you can see why animals, you know, if you throw a bone between two dogs, they're going to fight. You know, they, they go after each other. They don't know that principle, uh, but that's what we would be doing, the same, same thing. So that's our, really our human nature. Okay? So what, what is really keeping our... Our human nature in, in check is, is food and water that God has given us. So I was hungry, you fed me, thirsty, you gave me a drink. If you don't follow that gospel principle, you will destroy each other. Okay? Literally, you, you will. You'll become barbaric. You'll become animals. Okay? So that, that's a whole other realm of why Christ came in and made that so important. That if you don't care one for another, you're going to become barbaric. And what is all the, the difference between then and now is we have become barbaric in our leadership, okay, towards the poor and the needy just in a humane way. We just ignore the fact that they're out there in need, and that's fine with us, okay, in 2012. 
you know. So it's really, what's the difference? Take, the, take somebody's hope away, take their future away, take their freedom of life away, oppress them, uh, suppress them, knock them down, and then what's the difference? Then back, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred years plus ago, they would just kill somebody to get rid of them. You know, what's the difference? I mean, you take somebody's life away, you take their life away. If you take their future and freedom away, you've taken their life away. That's what our, our founding father <coughs> talks about, okay? So Jesus comes along and gives us, gives us basic principle of human nature. How you can do the same thing, you can take somebody's life away, and you never have to strike them. All you have to do is begin to treat them badly, okay? By power, by political maneuvers, okay? By being territorial, etc., also, naturally, we are prideful, selfish, deceitful. That's our human nature. That's who we are. It's all about us, okay? Uh, but the, the important one there is our unbelief. Right? And everyone has it. You have unbelief, and that's dangerous, okay? Because if we talked about last Sunday, you've got to remember that your, your human nature, Jesus never relied on human nature, but we do. And when you rely on human nature, what do you do? You, have, you find yourself lost. You always find yourself at the end with nowhere to go, no answers. Why? Because you relied on yourself, human nature, not Christ and his nature. And all of a sudden you come to this vanishing point, this point where that's it. There's, it's, it's not worth going any, any further. You start doubting God. You start not believing, questioning God. Everything we talked about last Sunday. There was a movie a long time ago. Uh, it was called Vanishing Point. Maybe some of you have watched that movie. Oh, yeah. Okay, it was an old, older movie. I can't remember the, the, the fellow that was uh, in there, but I think he was a car runner from, you know, East Coast to West Coast. And, and Tchaikovsky, I think was his name. And uh, he would uh, run these cars through the states and, and, you know, speed through them, and all the cops were always trying to catch him, and they never could. Well, there was a radio announcer that was blind that was always telling him, communicating with him kind of where the roadblocks were and stuff like that, and he was just running these cars back and forth so they could never catch him. Finally, at the end, they put up bulldozers on the road, you know, um, just sitting there, and he just ran the car right into them blew up, okay, called a vanishing point, you know, and that's what happens when we rely on our human nature, we just go right to the end, and we're just going to give up, okay, uh, that's what human nature will do, because we start uh, ourselves, we, we go into ourselves, we stop looking out to help others, we start to stop looking out to treat others properly, and we just close up within ourselves, and we're going to find ourselves lost, okay, now, our human nature... <clears throat> will make us believe in ourself and eliminate God, okay? Now, you can see that very clearly, can't you, in the, in the United States. You can see that across the board everywhere. Human nature and human power, all this stuff I mentioned, this, this power and to be political and territorial, what has it done? Remove God. Remove God out of the courts, remove God out of the schools, remove God everywhere, out of the, you know, basically out of the prisons. And that they, You know, you can't put God in a box, and, and let him out now and then. That, that doesn't work. That's, that's not God. Uh, God was never designed that way. And, uh, he never designed it to be that way. Um, and he's everywhere. And no man can ever tell you how to worship your God. Remember that. And uh, I don't care if you're in prison. I don't care if you're in the streets. I don't care where you are. Some of you may not know this. But do you realize that... Uh, and, and unfortunately we don't know this because... Uh, we have let human nature, okay, supersede Christ's nature, okay? Do you realize that if anywhere, you could be out in the street, or if you're in prison, do you realize that you were walking down the, the hall of the prison and your belief to pray is that at 1 o'clock that afternoon that you have every constitutional right to stop right there in that hall and pray? And the officers that are there took an oath of office that says that they will see to it that you have that right, and that right can never be taken away from you. <clears throat> Try. It's not going to happen, is it? Mm -hmm. It's a violation of the Constitution. It's wrong. Nobody's fighting it. They took a con the, the oath of office that says that they will support, defend, and obey the Constitution of the United States and of Pennsylvania. In that Constitution, it says nobody 
can stop you from your religious activities and your religious rights. But they're doing it, aren't they? Why are they doing it? That penalty is never removed from you. No matter what crime you commit, that penalty is never removed. Some other penalties are. Your Fourth Amendment right is removed. Search and seizure right. You lose that under penalty. But your First Amendment right to serve your God is not. But there's not enough people challenging it. That's how powerful it is. But what happened? We let human nature come over that. We let the human concept. So what have we done? We, re we actually removed the person's hope. We actually were telling somebody, no, you can't pray to your God at this time. No, you can't read your Bible at this time. No, you can't do that. That's human nature coming in and taking over the divine nature of God. And we're, the Christians are letting that happen. So what happens is these people become unbelievers. Okay, and you don't even know it. These unbelievers. But they're still professing Christ. You've got these very people that are doing that. Maybe officers in the system. Wherever they're literally stopping you or an individual from serving their God, but then they go in and walk into a church and profess Christ as Savior. These are the false people out there. These are the unbelievers, the plastic people. These are the goats. These are the ones that are actually saying, Yeah, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in God. We serve Him. But... You're not going to serve him unless you do it when we want to, how we want to, as we say you should. That's human nature. These are enemies of the cross. Period. I don't care how wonderful they are in church. I don't care how much they profess Christ. If they put their badge on or they put their hat on, whatever it is, and then they go out and start denying another human being their right to pray to God no matter where they are, or their right to read the Bible no matter where they are, then they are enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. You understand that? Yep. Very important to understand. That's where the, now this is where you get into the level of darkness that is hell, that uh, Satan comes in and makes it an angel of light. Okay? You can see how this angel of light is. So what we do is we collapse in human nature. That's what happens. We have collapsed in human nature because we don't want to believe. And that's the thing. People, that word believe is very powerful. It's, it's very, very powerful. Jesus said, those who believe, see me and believe in me will have eternal life. Okay? The word believe means pistis. It means faith. Faith means to resemble. It means to be like, to duplicate. That's what faith means. So belief is the same word. To believe in faith. To believe in him means to duplicate, to resemble, to look like, to live his life. So you got your human nature must be removed, and his life must take over. Your human nature must decrease, his life must increase. Because we have forgotten the most important things. Now listen now as we go through this. Uh, for those of you who went through the Kingdom of God series and the Kingdom of uh, uh, Heaven and... Uh, hell and that, but you, listen to this. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, that's, that's why you've forgotten the most important thing, because there's something more in there. Something you, you don't notice too much or hear too much, but it's called the kingdom of Jesus, all right? Now that's there, and, and okay, we've got the kingdom of God, and we've got the kingdom of heaven. Now the kingdom of heaven are all the things above that Paul talks about. All the things that we learn, and all the things that are good, that's tradition and religion, and that's all good, all right? And, and to, to follow through with, okay, the kingdom of heaven. It's all those things that are good in the heavenlies, okay? Then you've got the kingdom of God, that's God himself, the holy of holies, okay? The Father God. Then you've got the one, the meekest, is the kingdom of Jesus. That is where we are to be, but we don't ever go there. We don't ever understand the power of it. We're always on the, you know, we want the kingdom of heaven. We want the kingdom of God. Yes, we do. But what about the kingdom of Jesus? Didn't Jesus say uh, to Pilate, my kingdom is not here, so he, my kingdom? Okay, where, where do we ever look at the kingdom of Jesus? You know, we, we miss this. This is something very important. And, and but yet we, we don't grasp it. The kingdom of Jesus. You know why? Because we become unbelievers. Enemies of the cross. Are you one? The reason why you become an enemy of the, enemy of the cross, the reason why you don't see the kingdom of Jesus is because you believe in him. Alright? You know him. You'll profess him. You'll go to church. But you don't believe in living for him. 
You don't believe in doing what is necessary to fulfill his kingdom. You don't believe that you need to come under his kingship and serve him. You don't believe that. You believe that just by knowing him, professing him, and studying him, you got it all. No, you don't. You must come under his kingship. You must become in, uh, enter into the allegiance with him. Or you're relying on your human nature. You're going to always find yourself lost. You're going to find yourself questioning. You're going to find yourself doubting. What God calls that is unbelieving. And what did God say about unbelievers? What did he say is the worst sin there is? To not believe. To doubt the Holy Ghost. To not believe in the Holy Ghost. That sin will never be forgiven in this lifetime or the next. So now you can see people, don't go around and point your fingers at atheists. You know, an agnostic and, and those out there. And, and, and point your fingers at Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses and so on so quickly. And say, well, well, you don't believe in the one true God, so you're going to hell. You better be careful doing that. Because you can go around and look all wonderful in the name of Jesus and still be unbelieving in your heart. <coughs> you can still be completely unbelieving and living in a human nature of religion and self. And going out and living for that instead of truly living for the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's very obvious. Because look at the condition of our government. Look at the condition of the United States. Look at con the condition of our streets and our cities. Look at the, condi uh, the condition of drug use. Look at that now we're going to start legalizing marijuana in states. You're going to start seeing all kinds of people moving into these states. I'll tell you, what kind of political move is that? Tell me. Is legalizing marijuana, is that a divine nature or a human nature? Human nature. It's a human nature. And what's that human nature going to do? I mean, unless the politically smart <coughs> power, I'll tell you what, you want to get money in your state? You want to build your state? Let's legalize marijuana and just watch the moving van start coming into our state. That's exactly what you're going to see, isn't it? Yeah. Sure. All of a sudden, that state, California, is poor, aren't they? They need money. Well, hey, let's legalize marijuana. Well, gambling, everybody walking around stone, smoking joints and gambling. Hey, what more of a life would you want than that? Just think of all the, the, the thousands, the millions that will move in. All the nest eggs that will come with it. All the drug money that will come in. Yeah, that's human nature. That's no different than legalizing the alcohol. That's human nature. What would divine nature say? You know, uh, God forbid that you would, you would go out there and start reversing that process. Instead of focusing on the money and the money and getting richer and richer and prosper and prosper, why don't we focus on the, the, the you know, hundreds of thousands of people that lost everything and all their fortunes gambling in the casinos of California. Why don't we go out and do something for them, those people that have been making you rich and giving you paychecks for all these years that now lost everything. Now you want more money. That's the human nature. So the divine nature is collapsing. You know, it's really sad that when they want to bring casinos in the state of Pennsylvania, and before the casinos are even here, they want to start be, uh, building rehabilitation centers for the gambling addiction. Before they even start the gambling casinos. They're going to build one in, in Pittsburgh. They want to build it so that, yeah, when you get addicted to gambling, you can go. Isn't that crazy? This is human nature, isn't it? So what would human nature do? Start destroying people, doesn't it? You knowingly know that it's going to destroy. That's the wicked hell that Jesus warned about, and we're doing it all the time. Because why? They're enemies of the cross. And how many people do you think are behind this that are darkening the doors of a church today? Many. Many that are behind these casinos, these gambling centers, that this kind of human nature, and they're going into a church sitting down saying they know Jesus. They're enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. They don't even have the right to profess his name as far as I'm concerned. Amen. 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 See, your human nature must decrease, and divine nature must increase. Now, doesn't that sound like somebody in the Bible, John the Baptist? I must decrease, so he will increase. That was John the Baptist said, my human nature must decrease. But, he must increase. The kingdom of Jesus within me must increase. We're going to 2 Peter. That must increase within us. Okay? He, I must decrease in my human nature. And his divine nature must increase within me. Then we've got to understand a little bit of what that means. 2 Peter uh, 1. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. 
<coughs> According as his, as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Now, did, what did we just read there? Pretty much everything I just explained about human nature, right? Power, virtue, okay? Authority, all that. This, this is right in there. This is the God side now. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the... Divine nature. Divine nature. Okay? See that? Divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So remember, uh, Satan takes Jesus up on the mountain and says, Look, you can have all the world, all the gambling, you can have all the Walmarts and the you know, Kmarts and all the food places and, and all that stuff. The lust of the world. Human nature. Isn't that our human nature? Sure. So now God comes along and says, but the divine nature is going to what? Make you escape that. It's going to make you get out of that within yourself. What that means is it's going to make you make that less important. It's not that God doesn't want you to have it. It's not that God doesn't, doesn't say you don't need it. You need those things today in 2012. He wants you to, to use... Uh, the latest innovations and inventions to go out. But this is the only way, divine nature, that you will always keep Him Lord and Savior, okay, of your life. And make divine nature more important than your human nature. We have made the human nature our natural ability to go out and quest for desires, to go out and have more and more and more and more. And, and we have forgotten the divine nature of God. Now notice that, what it means, having escaped the corruption, meaning you're not letting yourself get caught up into the corruption. That means not you're not ignoring poverty in the world. You're not ignoring the homeless and the needy. You're not ignoring the kingdom of Jesus out there. That's what's happening. We're ignoring the kingdom of Jesus. Doesn't mean that you aren't worshiping the kingdom of God or you're not your desire isn't to be in the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that you don't want to be in the kingdom of heaven and your desires in the kingdom of and your desires to be in the kingdom of heaven. What it means is you are denying the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You are denying living it. So therefore, the day is going to come as a goat. He's going to look at you and say, "Depart from me. I don't know you." See, I don't know the kingdom of Jesus within you, the life. Sure you wanted the kingdom of heaven. Sure you talked all about heaven. Sure you wanted the kingdom of God. Sure you used my name. But you never lived for the kingdom of Jesus. That was the one thing that would bring you out of the corruption of the world. You never truly looked out into that world to see me. All you did was look out and look at the lights of the city and look at everything that you could acquire. I gave you all that if you used it wisely. You could benefit, but you forgot to look at the most important thing. You forgot to look at the needy and the homeless and the poor, the drug abuse out there. You forgot to look at what gambling is going to do to families. You know what that gambling is to me? You know what I call it is? It's nothing more than a dentist. That's what that is. That's dentistry. And what they're doing is they're bringing in these gambling casinos so they can go in there with their pliers and start pulling people's nest eggs out of their bank accounts. That's what they're doing. That's what they're doing, because they know the big boom from the 50s and through all the innovations, you know, TVs, everything, boom, 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 all right? That was an opportunity for people to make money and save it. Oh, yeah, like Rockway Glass here, the big glass, that was a big boom in industry, all that, all that, all, you know, now the people are all retired from that, they, that age, and they have nest eggs. Once those nest eggs are gone, look out. You don't have that opportunity again. So let's bring these in, and then we're, we're going to get the, the, this generation, their parents' money, their nest eggs, made that money through that time, okay? They got the money, we're going to come in there like a dentist, and we want to pull their teeth. We want to dangle this gambling out there in front of them. We want to get those nest eggs, get that old money out. And that's all that it is. What is it? Human nature. Human nature's power, political maneuvers, and we fall for it, instead of standing up to it. But how are you going to stand up to it if you aren't taught how? You know what? You don't stand up to anything for Christ because somebody comes out and is an advocate to do it. 
You don't stand up for Jesus Christ because I'm out fighting for the cause. If you're doing it for that reason, you're doing it for the wrong reason. You do it, you have to do it because you know in your heart what you're hearing is true. You know in your heart that the kingdom of Jesus should be the most important thing in your life. Because you know in your heart that you should be doing this and you're here hearing it today whether you like it or not. That's what you should go by. You're not doing it just because I'm up here saying to go do it. You don't do it because I'm up here preaching and saying this is what you must do. You do it because you know in your heart, body, and soul it's truth and it needs to be done. Amen. Then you go do it. Now, if you don't do it and you know that, you're an enemy of the cross, period. Amen. And an enemy of the cross has no chance of eternal everlasting life except to truly accept the life of Christ. And if you understand that, you are, tell, you are understanding the true divine nature of salvation. Amen. That once that is found within your heart and spirit, it can never be taken from you. You can't lose your salvation. Now, it doesn't happen if it's real. It's real. If you don't have it, you don't have it. And hell awaits you. The kingdom of Jesus or the kingdom of Satan? The kingdom of Satan is darkness. It's unbelieving. That's why Jesus says, how deep are you going to let that darkness get? See, Jesus can save you out of that darkness to a point. Once you reach a certain point and you sell your soul over to Satan, it's over. So he said, how deep are you going to unbelieve? How deep are you going to not believe in me? Thomas was entering some deep darkness, wasn't he? Thomas was doubting. He, was, he wasn't believing. And Jesus says, Thomas, you must believe. He pulled him out of that darkness. And he can pull you out of that darkness any time in your unbelief, out of your human nature. But you've got to let him. But if you keep going back each time to that darkness, you're going to keep going back deeper and deeper. And if you're worshiping your human nature, you can get to the point of no return. And you can sell your soul out. And then you're going to regret it, just like that rich man as he stood in hell. As he stood in hell and he looked across that chasm at the beggar in Abraham's bosom. And he was crying out for a drop of water. You know what he was saying? Help my unbelief. Father Abraham, help my unbelief. Too late. Go back. Send them back and tell my brothers they better what? Believe. They better believe. This unbelief is very dark. But he believed in God. He said, Father Abraham. He knew who God was. And so do many of you and many others out there. Many churches today, people are sitting in congregations praising Jesus. Saying they know Jesus. Singing to Jesus. How much they love Jesus. But in their heart, they have unbelief. They don't desire to go out and see Christ's face. You want to see Christ's face, you're going to see it in the places you don't want to look. Not in your churches. You're not going to see it in your bank account. More people are praising their bank account because they have money and giving Jesus the glory for it when that money came from Satan. It didn't come from Jesus. There's a lot of people right now that their checkbooks were zero. And they were giving Satan all the glory. Saying how Satan caused this. Why would he do this? Then all of a sudden they have thousands of dollars in their account. Now they're giving <coughs> Jesus all the glory. Jesus is saying, look, you've got it backwards. It was me that kept your bank account at zero. It's Satan that put it up to a thousand. Amen. Back when it was zero, you prayed to me. Back when it was zero, you looked to me. Back in the, when it was zero, you talked to me. Now you don't talk to me anymore. No, you're talking more to the people of the cashiers and the stores. You talk to them more than you talk to me. You, you put more work into carrying all your, your stuff out of the store's home than you do to go to church and do anything for anybody. Yeah, back when you had zero, that's what it was made. Now it's Satan. You understand? Amen. And, then, and then you go to church and say you believe. We got it so backwards. Look out these prosperity preachers out there. Yeah. Um, Ephesians 2. Give you something to think about. I don't like money. Ephesians 2. I'm going to look at a couple verses here. Ephesians 2, start verse 3. Among whom, among whom also we all had our conversations in time past in the lusts of the, our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh 
and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. There's that nature, right? That human nature. Our natural way is to become the children of wrath, to go out and to get for ourselves and live for our self-desires. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. So God comes along and says, Grace, I'm going to give you divine nature. Now you understand why he said to Paul, Paul, my grace is sufficient. My divine nature is sufficient. Seek that, find that, and it will be sufficient. The kingdom of Jesus. And then live it. Look at for, let's go to uh, Ephesians 6.12 now. Jump ahead a little bit. Ephesians 6.12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is where these natures collide. This is where your human nature collides with divine nature. This is where the Holy Spirit collides with your spirit. This is where Paul says the two spirits war together. See, you've got your human nature, all right? And in our human nature is where sin dwells. That's where Satan got us. Satan got us in the garden in our human nature, in our natural means to go out and fulfill our desires. That's where he nailed us, right here. Now God comes along, Christ comes along and says, Look, I can give you a divine nature. A divine nature that will supersede that, that will conquer that, that will wash you. It's the cross of Christ. It's love. It's my life. That nature, go out and live it. Not by works, by a desire in your heart through love and compassion. That there will supersede every sin that will ever enter your life. That's the power of the cross of Christ. So a lot of people are going around and they're saying, you think just because you said the sinner's prayer, you're saved. What's up with that? Do you realize that there's a big difference between saying, I'm saved because I said the sinner's prayer and truly being saved by the divine nature of Christ? Do you realize people just think that you think that you're saved because you said it? No. If I remember correctly, it says, if you profess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and what? Believe, believe in your heart. Now, that belief in your heart is between your heart and God. That's called the divine nature of Christ. Is it there or isn't it? If it's there, then you are going to listen to his commands to live his life. If it's not there, you're nothing but a religious hypocrite. You're unbelieving. You're only believing in yourself. You're only using his name as a name. And you're no different than the Pharisees and the heathens out there. You're unbelieving. It means you don't believe that his life is necessary to live. You don't believe that getting out there and helping the poor, the needy, and the homeless, and getting churches open for them, and getting the inmates out of prisons, and to stop this addiction to incarceration in our nation and our state, and to start standing up for the church and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And no, just because somebody falls short in sin doesn't mean they need to be in a jail cell. It means they have the right to their God for rehabilitation. Amen. That should be Amen. first and foremost. That is the nature, the divine nature of Christ. But are you fighting for that? No, the people aren't fighting for that. <coughs> oh, people will tell me, I see that in you, that's what you're fighting for. Yeah, what are you doing about it? Sure, it's nice to, to cheer, cheer me on to go do it more. What's that mean? I'm just doing what God showed me the cross is all about. That's all I'm doing. What are you doing about it? That's where the big question is. Oh, you're, you're either showing you believe or you don't believe. You're either showing that you're a part of heaven or you're a part of hell. You're either showing that you're just spitting in Christ's face or you truly are following him. That's what I see. 
you know, and then the prideful ones out there in their human nature will mock and, and scoff and say, yeah, right, we do our job. Yeah, right, sure you do. Yeah, it's one thing, a hurricane comes and all of a sudden people will rally together, won't they? Mm -hmm. Rally together and give all this money and this food and all this stuff just to clean their basements out and their attics and closets. Good time to do that and then look good at the same time. Oh, but nobody wants to see the, the emergency disaster that's all around us every day in our city streets and the starving. And the, no, they don't want to see that, do they? They don't want to look at that because it doesn't happen in a moment. Nobody wants to do anything about it. Well, that's what Jesus did. Did you ever notice Jesus didn't get too excited at disasters, did he? He, he really didn't. I mean, come on, why don't you think about this? What do you think he was witnessing every day when he was walking around? People were getting beat, man. They were getting beat to death. People were getting, you know, misused. Can, can you imagine it? He was pretty calm about that, wasn't he? Because there was a bigger emergency. And it was the homeless and the poor and the needy hidden in our streets and everywhere else nobody wanted to see. But he could see. That's why he said, look, disasters are going to come, and they're going to go. But the poor is going to always be out there. <clears throat> always. That disaster will always be there, and you better care for them. Amen. You better make sure that you do the right thing. You better make sure that you walk in the kingdom of Jesus. Well, I don't want to hear that. Well, good, don't listen then. You just, I'll see you at the throne, and so will you. You know what divine nature means? Divine, now listen carefully. This is what divine nature means. You look it up. It means force, laws, and order. Okay? And we know that God is a God of power. He is a God of laws and a God of order. We talked about that. Remember, Joe? There's no order in darkness. You don't have any order. It's all about you. It's all about, you know, getting what you want. There's no order to it. Only your order. There's no divine order of God. So divine nature means this. Force, laws, and order. But it also means this, very important. It means growth by germination. Okay? Very important. Divine nature is growth by germination. Does that ring a bell? It's like a man. Then planted a seed. And the seed does what? Germinate. It grows. That's what divine, you can look it up yourself. That's what divine nature means. Growth by germination. So it goes right back to where Jesus teaches. Remember, the Bible teaches itself. You have to look into the Word. So this divine nature you're looking for, people you're going around saying, well, what's that mean? What's that mean? Well, there it is. You just had, what, nine, ten sermons on it. It's like a man that took a seed and planted it in the ground. And he let it grow within him, a divine nature. Well, how's that nature going to grow? It's going to grow by doing what the man taught you, Jesus Christ. And what did he teach? Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Help the poor and the needy. Look at it over the land. Then go and prosper. No, but people don't want to do that, do they? They don't like doing that. See, it must be watered by the word and fertilized by the deeds, people. See, once that seed's planted, that divine nature, you must water it by the word. Jesus is the word, right? His life is the word. What he lived for and stood for. Well, now, when you begin to, to do that, the deeds come out. Not works. The deeds is the fertilizer. Those two together are working, watering and fertilizing you into the divine nature that conquers all sin. doesn't mean you're not going to be a sinner anymore. It means that you have made your human nature less than the divine nature of Jesus Christ. How do I do that? Don't be an enemy of the cross. Don't be a two-faced hypocrite. You're better off just don't even mention the name of Jesus Christ if you're going to be a two-faced hypocrite and not live his life. Don't even mention his name. He doesn't deserve that. But if you mention his name and he truly is the God and Savior of your life, then what do you do? You better start living it. And now how do you live it? You don't live it for yourself. You don't look within yourself and be self-centered and selfish. You start looking out where Jesus is in the world. And then start doing something about it. Amen. A lot of you in here, I see so many of you come through here. You use the ministry to get a little bit of money and then you're gone. Well, Jesus will have something to say about that, whether you like it or not. 
And then you want to call yourself a Christian. Especially you walk in here and see such a need. Anyone who comes in here and calls himself a Christian, and you don't look around and see the need and how many people are here, that we have a problem, and then go out and do something about it in the name of Jesus Christ, you better check your salvation. Amen. You better see if you truly are a warrior for the cross, or if you're an enemy of the cross. Amen. Amen. Because you see a lot of that. As soon as money comes into somebody's hand, it becomes Lord. Money triggers your human nature. Look out, you become a complete idiot. When it comes to Christ, sure you do. You don't become an idiot to the world because that way you're making somebody else rich out there and happy because you're spending your money. That's why we're in the condition we're in. See, planting the seed is the cross. To believe is the growth. You plant it at the cross to believe is the growth. It's divine nature, not human nature. And that's either believing or unbelieving. You're one or the other. And you can go around and you can be as wonderful as, as, as uh, the Pope, if that's what you want to compare him to, and do all the wonderful things in the world, look good, and still be unbelieving. You can still look out over a world and see people that are oppressed and knocked down and can't make it, and just ignore it. And not believe that that's what Christ would want you to do. <clears throat> Isn't that sad? Mm -hmm. Now do you see why Jesus said Caiaphas has the greater sin? You know why Caiaphas had the greater sin? He should have known it was Jesus, but not only that. Because for three years Jesus taught in the streets of how to help those in need, and Caiaphas didn't believe it. It wasn't that he didn't believe he was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It was that Caiaphas did not want to go out there and get his hands dirty and help people. Now, do you see why Nicodemus came out at night? See? He was not believing. Could you imagine Nicodemus going out in the streets during the day and following Jesus and helping the poor and the needy? No. Because that would show he was believing in the kingdom of Jesus. So he would come at night and he would say, well, well, now, Jesus, what is this now? Can you just explain it a little bit more? You know, uh, this salvation thing, what does it mean to be born again? He said, you, a teacher of Israel? How, how can you say that? You should know that what I'm doing every day, going out and helping people, was what was to come. Why don't you want to go do it, Nicodemus? Well, my human nature. I, you know, oh, I'm powerful. And it'll make me weak. And humble, and they won't like me anymore. Jesus said, Yeah, so that's called divine nature. Don't you want that? Maybe you don't want that. You just want salvation and all the good stuff that comes with heaven and the kingdom of God. You don't want the kingdom of Jesus. The kingdom of Jesus is a tough place. What good could come out of Nazareth? The kingdom of Jesus is a place that will, you know, knock you down a little bit and, and make you mad. You know, the kingdom of Jesus is a place to where, at times, you just want to walk away and just give up. The, the kingdom of Jesus is times when you would, you know, maybe want to go and flip over some tables or... You know, maybe grab a chicken and wring its neck. <laughs> and, then, and then say, here, Peter, there's lunch. You know? Yeah, seriously. Huh? I mean, I mean, think about it for a moment. Okay, to have was a place where, could you imagine what Jesus was, was, was when he was walking around and people were staring at him and spitting on him? <coughs> mocking at him, calling him all these names, and he's walking around with all his disciples. And all of a sudden, he can just walk away. A little bit upset? Yeah, the kingdom of Jesus is like that. What do you think Jesus was, was thinking whenever he was walking along the road and there was men uh, lined up on crosses dying, some already dead, some almost dying, some dying right as he walked by, some, you know, crying out. Family members at the cross crying with them. And he's watching this. What do you think he thought? 
Why? Well, that was a disaster. See, when we think of Jesus on the cross, we just think of him on Calvary uh, with, with two other people. No, back then it was lines of crosses, people dying on them. People being whipped. Very barbaric. Don't you think that would be like a disaster today? Yep. Well, why didn't Jesus stop it? Because he knew the nature of man. It's always going to be like that. So where does Jesus go? He goes out to the poor and the needy. The natural disaster caused by the principality of darkness, the wickedness. And he started walking among them. I mean, think about it. They mock Jesus and they say, Hey, Jesus, why don't you get down off of that cross? Well, why did they say, Jesus, if you're, if you're God, why don't you get all these people down off the cross? Why weren't they telling him to do that? Why are you reading that in the Bible somewhere? Maybe some of you has never really, never really uh, understood that too well, huh? Why didn't they tell Jesus? And why aren't you reading it in the Bible? Jesus, why don't you stop these whippings and beatings? Why don't you stop all these, these people being crucified and tortured? You don't read that in there, do you? You know why? This is how foolish man is. This is how cold-hearted and how powerful human nature is. They were more worried about him helping the poor people and the outcasts. But that's where their focus went. How dare you do that to them? They were so caught up in what his ministry was doing that they didn't even come out and say, but why don't you help all these people on the cross dying and all these prisoners? Can you imagine the thoughts going through your Savior's mind? That these people are so cold-hearted and ignorant that they're going to kill me because I'm out helping the poor and the needy and healing those in need. They're attacking me for doing that. But they aren't coming to me wanting me to stop all this barbaric torture. You might ask yourself, why? I'll tell you why. Because if you would have stopped it, they wouldn't have tortured and beat your Lord and Savior. he helped people. Wow. That's simple. Beaten because he helped people. Can't get it simpler than that, can you? And he would have looked at all that barbaric torture perfectly okay. And God comes down and walks through that and starts helping people. And they kill him for it. Human nature. So what are we doing today? you got children and human beings starving to death being thrown around all over this world. No different than being crucified and whipped. And we don't care, do we? We aren't doing anything about it. But boy, as soon as you go out and start trying to, to provide places for those in need, look what you've got to go through. People want to destroy it and stop it. That's human nature. That's the divine message that Jesus was trying to get across. How can we say, as a Christian nation, that we believe in the cross of Christ? 
if we are letting 18,000 children die every day from starvation in this world, how? We can't. How can we put commercials on TV that says, with a child dying from a disease, and an adult there that says, it's not science that's the problem, it's the funding. If we had the funding, we could save this life. Isn't that crazy? And when you've got, you know, 800 and some billionaires in the United States. You know, and then I watch and I hear that, uh, you know, the Red Cross accumulated, what, I don't know, a few million dollars or something. You know, maybe it was even a hundred or some million for the Sandy emergency. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know, to these billionaires, that's a drop in the bucket. But what really gets me is I wonder if they profess to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Unbelieving. Hey, rich man, go and sell what you have and give it to the poor, and you'll have everlasting life. I don't want to do that. I don't believe in it. But I believe you're Jesus. I believe you're God, but I don't believe in that life. I don't believe I have to do that. <coughs> no, Jesus said, you know what? No, you don't have to do that. I'm commanding you to do that. And if you don't do that, I'm going to burn you in hell. Amen. Amen. Hey, simple enough? Yeah. Yeah, you, can, you should applaud on that one. <laughs> Luke 12. Luke 12. Everybody has it too comfortable today. That's the problem. Luke 12, verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? This is who is that faithful and believing servant, okay? The one who believed that what I taught to do was what needed to be done at all costs. Who is that? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. There's that doing, all right? That you are doing what I commanded you to do. Works does not get you to heaven. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. Remember that. The grace of Jesus Christ. But the works will follow. There must be the deeds, okay, which are the fertilizer. It's the evidence that Christ is your, truly your Lord and Savior. And it all depends on what you do with it. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he has. Now remember, to think of all things good in the heavens. That's all that he has. But, and if that servant say in his heart, here's this human nature. My Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in asunder. This is an hour not aware. You're going to be so deep in your darkness that you aren't going to be able to see when the Lord comes. You're going to be so deep in your human nature, in yourself, that you're not going to see it because you did not believe in what Jesus wanted you to do. Doesn't mean that you aren't going to have bad times. Doesn't mean that you aren't going to fall in your sin. You are. What it means is you're relying on your human nature to live and not the divine nature of Christ. And when He comes, He will cut you in two and will appoint His portion with the unbelievers. Notice he says unbelievers there. Remember the man that came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, help my unbelief. He brought his son to him. Lord, help my unbelief. Jesus said, you believe. And the, uh, Jesus, he said to Jesus, Jesus, help my unbelief. I've got to get out of this unbelief. I've got to believe that who you are and what you do is what's needed. 
you remember the centurion that came to Jesus? <clears throat> and he told Jesus, he said, look, Jesus, don't you come to my house. You're not, I can't have that. I'm not worthy of that. But, but I know and believe. I have faith. I know you. And Jesus said, I have not found so much faith in all of Israel. Believe. This man removed all his human nature. He was a centurion. He had servants. He removed all his power, all his political thought process, all his pride to see. He came to the Messiah humbly and said, Lord, have mercy on me. I can't even have you come to my home. That's how much of a sinner I am. But I know and I believe that who you are and what you're doing is what's needed. I believe that. That is my nature and my heart. And I believe it. And Jesus says, there it is. That faith is what the disciples needed to learn. Amen. To put away your human nature and to make Christ's nature number one in your life. And he says what? His portion with the unbelievers. Those who have reached complete darkness. Doesn't mean they aren't professors. They are. They're professors, but they're unbelievers. Because if you see, it goes, the Lord of that servant will come in the day when he looketh not for him in an hour when he is not aware. Now notice up here, verse 45, he says, but and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord, so this person's calling him Lord, isn't he? See? He's professing. My Lord isn't coming. I know Jesus isn't coming. Jesus could come and say, look, you don't believe. Yes, you call me Lord. Yes, you call me Jesus. But you do not believe in my kingdom, what I stand for and what I do. Instead, what did you do? You went out and you ate and you drank and you prospered and you knocked down your servants. You pushed the poor down into poverty, lower and lower. Now, cast them out with the unbelievers. You know what unbelieving means? It means without faith. It means faithless. Rejecting the true faith without trusting in Christ. What do you think trusting in Christ means? See, for, for most people, thinks trusting in Christ means that you're going to trust in Christ to answer your prayers and make everything just fine with you. No, that's not what it is at all. <coughs> trusting in Christ means <coughs> trusting in Him that you're going to be able to have the strength to go out and help others as He Amen. taught. Amen. That's trusting in Christ. That's why he said, follow me. He was saying, disciples, trust me. You have to do as I do. We think trusting in Christ is, well, we're going to trust in Christ to answer this problem. We're going to trust in Christ to answer this problem. <coughs> no. Why don't you trust in Christ to get out there and help somebody else with their problem and then watch what he does with your problems? Amen. Amen. Some of you should learn that, and you better learn it you know, rather quickly, it would be good for you. Verse 47, And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Now, you've got to remember, the Bible tells us that they were allowed 40 stripes, whips. Okay? So they would go 39. Now, if you would go over 39, then that would bring shame to you. So, that this servant doesn't get beat with many stripes. So that means you're going to be very close to the line. Very close to the 39, 40, you're playing with your eternal soul. It says this servant, who knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself... You're coming very close to eternal damnation. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more. Human nature will always ask more of you. Human nature will always bring you down and demand more and demand more. And how deep will you let that darkness get? Mm. 
We're going to go to Colossians 1. Colossians 1, start at verse 13. Now listen carefully. So you can pick up on this. Colossians 1, starting at verse 13. <coughs> Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of uh, his yes. dear Son. The kingdom of Jesus. Jesus. He has translated us. That means transferred us, transformed us over to the kingdom of his dear son. A place where very few went to walk. Now walk. It's this kingdom, people. This is the kingdom of Jesus that will walk you through the outer court, the holy place, and to the holy of holies. This is the kingdom that will walk you through the kingdom of heaven and into the kingdom of God forever. This is the kingdom that you must have. The kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ. Watch verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Only in the kingdom of Jesus will you find that. It starts at the cross. Amen. That new nature, divine nature. You don't have it. You don't have the life of Christ. You don't have eternal life. You're nothing but a fake professor. Watch verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. The kingdom of Jesus is above all. That name. That kingdom will become the kingdom of the Father one day. Because he made all his true children the children of the living God. That's what the life of Christ. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. The kingdom of Jesus is the kingdom that you will follow into the kingdom of God. And if that divine nature isn't within you, you're not going you're going to be stopped at the gate, right at the throne. You're going to be stopped at the gate of hell, and you're not going to get through it. The doorkeeper, Jesus Christ, is going to say, I don't know you, but Lord, Lord, we profess your name. We cast out devils. No, that was your nature. That was your human nature. That was your own theology. <coughs> you walked in the kingdom of yourself. You never truly walked in the kingdom of Jesus. You never looked through my son's eyes to see what he was seeing. Well, how do we know that? He says, because I was hungry and you fed me not. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you took me not in. You didn't have that nature. You had your own nature. Well, but what does your nature look like, Jesus? What does your divine nature look like? What, what is it that's going to let me come into the kingdom of God? And he says, I was hungry and you fed me. Thirsty and you gave me a drink. A stranger and you took me in. Wow. Maybe you don't want to do that. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. <laughs> For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. Is that where you're dwelling? Can you honestly say that you're dwelling in the kingdom of Jesus? 
where, where it says that this is what pleased the Father. Didn't God say, the Father say when Jesus was baptized, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You can't praise God till you please God. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. So what did Jesus look like? What did the kingdom of Christ, Jesus Christ, look like? It looked like a man. He planted a seed. A man that went out and worked. A man that walked among the poor. The man that let the strangers come up and touch him. The man that brought the sinners in around him. Ate with them. Talked with them. That's the likeness of his son. I'm going to tell you something, people. For those of you who don't quite understand this, I said it the other day, but you better start understanding it. Jesus became a sacrificial lamb, didn't he? You've got to understand something here. Flesh and bone is not sin. Do you understand that? Your flesh and bone is not sin. It's not, it's not bad. Jesus was flesh and bone. He was, he's not sin. It's what's in here. When Jesus died on the cross as a sacrificial lamb, what did he offer to God? He offered his life, everything he lived for, for those years. He went out and he became the high priest. So what did he do, people? The high priest in the Old Testament would have to get all the arrangements of the, the tabernacle ready before he went behind the curtain, right? Okay, what did Jesus do for three years? He went out into the tabernacle of the world and he made ready. He went out and healed people, touched them, was among the poor. And then he died on the cross and presented that to God. And what did God say? Come into my hands. Is that what you're offering to God? If you don't have that within you, then forget it. You don't have the son. When he died, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He said, into your hands I commit everything I've done while I walk this earth. Into your hands I commit as I went out and walked among the poor and healed and forgave and loved. I'm giving you that. Is that the sacrifice? And guess what? The curtain split in two. And God said, yes it is, son. You don't have that. You're nothing but a two-faced, double-minded Hey, that's the truth. I can't change it. If you don't understand that, then that's a problem that you can deal with God. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, there it is, and having made wide through the blood of the cross, because in the blood is the life. In the blood is what you stand for. That's why you say it to communion. This is my blood. Drink it. This is my life. This is my character. This is who I am. This is what will cause forgiveness of sin. Amen. My life. Go live it. That's the forgiveness of sin. Not the act of drinking it. Because you lived it. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, he made peace through the cross to the Father because his life and what he lived in his ministry was accepted by the Father to sanctify the very spot where Satan defiled the throne of God. Are you with me in the Bible? Yeah, amen. Amen. By him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind, see, in your human nature, by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. Your human nature or wicked works, there's that word wicked again, right? Wicked is the de depths of hell. But by his life, what he ministered, what he was here,
by believing in that, understanding that, God accepted that and said, this is what will sanctify you. That is why the Holy Ghost will come into your life and guide you into all truth. The Holy Ghost will always point to the life of Jesus Christ, always telling you to open up your eyes and look for the poor and the needy out there. That is your Christian responsibility. It is a commandment. If you understand that, you have to do it, or you are an enemy of the cross, and you are trampling the blood of Jesus Christ in the ground. What you're doing is you're taking that life. When you hear that trampling in the ground, you are taking the life of that man, his characters and what he lived for, and you are trampling in the ground saying, no, I don't believe in that. All i got to do is go and pray and have some communion, and I'm fine. I don't have to worry about the starving and the hungry and the poor and those being evicted and those who can't make it, those who are mentally challenged and will never be able to get out there and get work. I don't have to worry about that. Somebody else will. No, that's an enemy of the cross and you'll find yourself in hell. Amen. 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 But instead, when you treasure that life of Jesus Christ, you will look at it and you will say, what can I do? I can only do a little bit. Well then, you can do something. That's exactly what that thief on the cross said when he looked over at Jesus. And he said, Jesus, you have done nothing wrong. Your life is what the world needs. That's why Jesus looked at him and said, you know what? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Amen. You know what he said? He said, remember me, Jesus. And you know when he said, remember me, you know what card he played? He said, remember me. And that's what he played. Remember that I believe in you. Remember that I believe that what you have done in the world and what, who you have touched and accepted in your life, how you showed love and forgiveness, I believe that that's what the world needs. And Jesus said, because of that, you will be in paradise. The other thief didn't have that. The other thief believed. He said, get us down from here. You have the power, Jesus. I really don't care how you live your life. I don't have to live it that way. Just get me down so I can go to Walmart and buy some boots. Yeah. Seriously. That's what, that's what you see. The enemies of the cross, the unbelievers dressed in sheep clothing. It's darkness of the deepest kind, people. Some of you are carrying it with you today. Some of you are nothing more than professors. You don't care whether you live the life of Christ or not. Well, he does care. And he wants to save your soul from a living hell. But that's where it's going. And so does the rest of the world out there. You know, he made it pretty easy to go around and, you know, confess the name of Jesus and come and sit in the church for an hour or two and then go home. He made it pretty easy. So you think. So you can evaluate your own heart. See if you're an enemy of the cross or you truly are a warrior of the cross. And you know what? You don't have to tell anybody. You do have to show them whether you like it or not. But see, when you believe in the heart that Jesus truly is your Lord, that means you're saying that the blood that flows through your heart contains his life. And out of that's going to reflect the gospel. And what's that going to look like? It's going to look like somebody who understands what it means to help those in need. Just like Jesus did. So remember the little bracelets, the, the evangelical spiel to make some money. What would Jesus do, bracelets? Hmm. You know what? I think if you walk up and show him one of those bracelets, you know what he'd do? Just walk away. Let me show you. He'd just walk away. He'd probably walk, walk away over there next to you know a huge hurricane would develop. He'd be so mad. What's up with that? What would Jesus do? Yeah, you should. Enemies of the cross. 
That's a, that's a good one. You should know what Jesus would do. Not by words, by actions. Hey, he can start any time. There's people all over in need. There's a ministry here that has developed ways of doing that. You're part of it. Pretty bad when you have to get on a waiting list to go to a church. Yes, it is. <laughs> Isn't it? It is. It's sad. pretty sickening that you have to get on a waiting list to come out of jail to go to a church. That's really sad. Nice. That's a government that is an enemy of the cross. <coughs> but beware. Jesus might say, and what are you doing about it? <laughs> Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? What are you going to do about it? You can decide yourself if you're an enemy of the cross or not. You get with God on that. Just remember, it's between you and your eternal soul. I hope you're able to remove your human nature and truly let his divine nature increase. Not by words, but by living out his life. Let us pray. Dear Father, we just thank you, Lord, for today and your word. Lord, we thank you for the cross. And Lord, we thank you for that divine nature that each and every one of us can have as a free gift. And Lord, help us to have that so many of us that have been through some tough times and for many different reasons. Help us not rely on our human nature to get out of it. Help us to rely on your divine nature, your life that you taught by helping others to do that and in so doing you will provide all that's needed. Your word says seek first the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ and all else will be added. Let that be our cry, let that be our heart's desire to live out your life. Don't let us become an enemy of the cross. Let us be warriors for the cross in your life. In Jesus' precious name we pray.